begin this set of onstage modules on narrative with a couple who I think are rather remarkable. Uh, Jim and Deb Fallows are journalists, they are chroniclers, they are travelers, they are uh, personal heroes of mine because, well actually Jim Fallows doesn't even, maybe may not even know this, but I first came to know Jim Fallows who is a journalist and national correspondent at the Atlantic uh, through a book he wrote in, I don't know, 1989 or 88, uh, called More Like Us. And you think about the way seeds get planted, you know, uh, there's a very straight line to draw between his book called More Like Us and our convening here today called Who Is Us? Because the argument that Jim was making then, he, he and Deb had been living in Japan, and this was at a time when it seemed like Japan was rising and America was declining and Japan was going to be the wave of the future. And everybody was trying to figure out, well, what can America do? How can America become more like Japan? How can America imitate Japan so that we can be competitive, so that we can be a thriving country for another century? And Jim's simple argument was, America doesn't need to be more like Japan. America just needs to be more like us. America needs to remember the things that make this country interesting and potentially exceptional. Emphasis on potentially, right? And so Jim and Deb, uh, most recently, for those of you who are readers of The Atlantic Magazine, you will see in the current issue, the cover story um, is a powerful distillation of nearly three years of travel they've done, actually on their own aircraft, flying around from small town to small town in the United States in search of something of a counter to the dominant narrative that prevails in American life today. The dominant narrative is, again, quarter century later, different Asian country on the rise, but again, America's in decline. The dominant narrative is the system is broken. The dominant narrative is the game is so rigged there's no point in people participating or showing up. There's no point in showing up for gatherings like this. There's no point in showing up in elections. There's no point in getting involved because we're past that tipping point. And Jim and Deb have been on some journeys which they've chronicled and they have found actually a different narrative a narrative of American resilience, a narrative of American renewal, sprouting locally perhaps, not seen in the Beltway and not seen certainly in our national election, and yet something that is very real and grounded in the lived experiences of so many of our fellow Americans. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Jim and Deb Fallows. So I am Jim of Jim and Deb. We're going to take turns uh, speaking from the podium and the other one of us sitting on the chair. I'm really grateful to Eric for his gracious introduction and for what he's done here over the years. And I just wanted to explain why, even though Deb and I are of a different generation from some of you in the room, and even though we are from the mainstream media, which doesn't put us, start us out on excellent footing perhaps, we feel exactly in sync with what everybody here is doing, and I want to try to explain why we are so excited about what we've seen and what, what you are doing and how we think there is a connection and how we hope we, we can help. Um, as Eric said, the question of who is us, how can we be like us, and American identity has been on my mind, on our minds for a very long time. Deb and I are both small town Americans. I grew up in a farming community in inland Southern California where orange growing was the main activity. Deb is from a little town in Northern Ohio where it was mainly a, a car, car plant. We have spent a lot of our time looking at America from the outside. We were married at age 21 when we were living in England. We had our honeymoon on a work camp in Ghana, which is a separate story. We raised our children for a long time in Japan and Malaysia. Uh, we spent the second George W. Bush administration and the first part of the Obama administration living in China, trying to see how the US looked from that perspective. And as Eric uh, said in his introduction, What's become clear looking at America from outside is a sense of American identity that I've tried to um, convey in Atlantic articles and books and all the rest, which involves the fact that mobility, continued inclusion, continued wrestling with the original sin of race, continued struggling against all the barriers that keep people from realizing their potential, that is the meaning of American citizenship. And, that, and embracing that tumult is something that makes America possible and we've tried to promote. 
The latest way in which we've tried to look into this theme is something I would like to spend 10 hours telling you about, and I've spent 10,000 words telling you about in the current Atlantic, but I'll do the next seven minutes or so just to give you a précis, which is what we saw when we tried to look at the fabric of the United States in this year, starting 2013 to 2016, through some lens other than just the national media narrative of what's Donald Trump saying now, how angry are the people at his rallies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we had come back from China where the story was of complete American collapse, as it had been when we were living in Japan long ago. And so to sort of telescope the process, we started looking for cities that weren't usually in the media, medium-sized or smaller cities. Seattle's always in the news, New York is always in the news, but Fresno is not, unless there's a disaster. Northern Mississippi is not, unless there's some meth epidemic or things like that. So we came up with a list of a couple hundred of these cities. We've been for extended periods to, uh, to a couple dozens of them in every corner of the country. Actually, if, I think the next slide will give you an idea of the kinds of places we have been. Uh, we have a little single engine propeller plane, a, a Cirrus, and there are 5,000 airports in the country. Every place in the United States has a little airstrip there, so we've flown around from place to place, interviewed people. And what has struck us, what I, I describe in this article and Deb's companion to it, and which we'll be happy to talk about in the time to come, is something that on the one hand includes our knowledge of everything that is a challenge for the United States right now. It is the second Gilded Age. Our national politics are profoundly dysfunctional. We are having new awareness of, if not new incidents of, official state violence against racial minorities. We have, uh, the United States has, as just like every other country on earth, we have the results of globalization putting pressure on people in, in the middle. We know all those things. What I think fewer people know is about the kinds of efforts many of you here are involved in city by city to respond to these pressures, to find ways not to act just as passive objects of large historical forces that are distorting things around the world, but as people who are in control, of, or at least potential control, of the destiny of their communities, their families, their organizations, their states, and all the rest. And I have a list here of 10 or 12 of these traits. I'm just going to mention a couple of them that I think are particularly um, interesting. One is a sense of movement city by city, you find, which is in contrast to the national narrative. Again, the national narrative is, woe is us, impacted politics, nobody can do anything, it's four more years, eight more years of stagnation. People, every place we go, say that's true of the nation, but not of South Dakota, not of Mississippi, not of South Carolina, not of Maine, not of Vermont, despite all the, the state pol political questions, we, we, uh, problems we know there. Uh, another and crucial thing in this electoral era is the national mood on immigration. I contend that the fury and furor about immigration as a, an electoral issue is a largely ginned up phenomenon. Here's what I mean. Before that time when Donald Trump came down the escalator, as he's referred to every single time, and said they're sending us rapists, if you looked at opinion polls around the country, uh, immigration was like in the top 15 issues people were concerned about, but usually not the top 10. If you went to places very heavily affected by immigrant flow, you found it seen as a process but not an emergency or a disaster. And we've been to a lot of those places in Michigan where they're having lots of uh, Latinos in the school systems in Arizona and, and, and all the rest. And so through American history, immigration has always been disruptive, but the U.S. has found ways to cope with it. And that is what distinguishes the U.S. from most other uh, nations and is our long-term strategic advantage in who is us, that we can become the world. And I contend that, the, that this was not seen as a real issue until it became an, an issue the, uh, through the, the Trump campaign, so I can say more about that later. In the realm of education, everybody knows that nationally American schools are in trouble, but city by city by city, including in the Deep South, including in poor parts of the Plain States, people would say, oh yes, come see our elementary school for engineering here in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Oh yes, come see our, our Mississippi School for Math and Science and see the astonishing things we're doing there. Uh, we found, uh, as I chronicle, chronicle in the article, manufacturing startups around the country. Uh, we found a, a particular manufacturing startup that is a marker of a city on the rise is, do you have a craft brewery? 
Now that sounds like a joke, but actually is a, a significant uh, thing. Uh, we found that people view politics on the national scale as paralyzed, but at the local level, they're able to wrestle with issues and there are still power imbalances everywhere, but come to some kind of, of conclusion. Uh, we've often also found, again, some interesting contrast to what we all know of as the big sort. The big sort is the media narrative is that if you're really ambitious in technology, you'll come to San Francisco or Seattle. If you're ambitious in politics, you'll go to DC. If you're ambitious in finance, you'll go to New York, et cetera, et cetera. We found, of course, that's going on. Meanwhile, people are saying, I'm really ambitious in technology, and I like the city of Fresno. And in Fresno, I can make a difference in people's lives. I like the city of Duluth. And there's a, 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 an effort underway in Duluth to make this a, a, a center, and I can feel as if I have some control over my family's future. Also, real estate does not paralyze me and cripple me in, you know, if you're not on these, these, uh, these frontiers. And again, overall, we found a sense in America of people aware that the nation is subject to the forces everybody here has studied and has, has, has noted, but people are responding to them, finding ways to organize in the way that you all are talking about. And our ambition is to help connect and tell some of those stories. It's very easy in the national media to go to some political rally and point a microphone in front of somebody and say, oh yeah, I love Trump and I hate foreigners. You can find those people easily. It's harder to tell the disparate collected stories of the efforts like ones you are, are undertaking. So we hope in the rest of our time here today and, and in the future, we'll be able to hear more about what you're doing. We have about six more months of this travel underway. And now for, now Deb is gonna tell about a particular institutional revival that she's been concentrating on. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Eric, and all of you for having us here. I want to talk to you today for a few minutes about a public institution in America that is thriving, that is more than thriving, as it speaks to the needs and wants of its citizens, and that is the public library. The public library. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good crowd. Okay. I've been to public libraries in nearly every of the two dozen or so towns that we've visited, and I want to tell you about some of the things that I've seen in those towns particularly because they're local points of action. In Columbus, Ohio, uh, an original Carnegie Library, above the door, sculpted in large letters, are the words, open to all, which pretty much sums up what libraries do. Uh, it's under a large renovation by the very philanthropic community of Columbus, and if you go there at 9 o'clock in the morning, you will see lined up waving outside every morning the homeless people who are going to spend their day inside the library. In Charleston, West Virginia, during the recession, they voted, the people of Charleston voted a tax levy to support the library, which was about to go under. In Eastport, Maine, there is a Passamaquoddy English dictionary that is like this thick, that sits on a pedestal in the main room of the library. In Ajo, Arizona, the librarians keep the Wi-Fi open all night because that's the only source of free Wi-Fi in the town, and people are sitting outside as we were using that, having that access to the free Wi-Fi. In Bend, Oregon, they cooperate with about 30 civic institutions. There's a social worker on staff to deal with the most important question that people bring in, which is, how can I pay my rent? How can I keep my house going? In Ferguson, Missouri, the libraries stayed open when the schools closed. In Columbus, Mississippi, there's a Civil War archive where the students of the high school go to learn about their past, students of all races and colors and ethnicities, and they read the original soldiers' journals and the original records of the slave trade. In Redlands, California, the most popular volunteer organization is teaching adults how to read. In Winters, California, the new library is put between the school and the pool so that the kids can hang out there. And everywhere around the country, the public libraries offer preparations for citizenship. This is not your mother's library. It's well beyond books. It's all about education, community and civic activities, and technology centers. I'm going to talk to you about the last one for just a minute, technology on the high end and the low end. 
On, on the high end, libraries are much more than access to free computers. They are access to maker spaces, and I'm talking about 3D printers, wire benders, laser cutters, the software and hardware that feeds instruction into the 3D printers. And this is for another movement, the maker movement, which is the combination of entrepreneurs, inventors, experimenters, the modestly craftsy, and artists who are who are an underpinning of the new economy, manufacturing and entrepreneurial economy in America. Um, they go to there to the maker spaces to use this content, to use these tools, you can think of it as high-end shop that you used to know in your youth, uh, to make what they make. And if you're a skeptic, I'll just remind you that Ben Franklin conducted most of his early experiments on electricity in the in the library company of Philadelphia, which was one of the first libraries. On the low end here, I'll end up with a, a small story which happened in Columbus, Ohio. Many people go into the libraries to get help in looking for a job. One young man went into the library for that case. The librarian said, sure, she helped him locate online a job that he wanted to apply for. She drew up the application and said, fill it in. I'll be back in 20 minutes to check it. She came back in 20 minutes, and he had indeed filled in that application, but with a marking pen on the screen of the computer. So that is an indication of how necessary it is to have high and low tech in libraries. So, so to answer Eric's question in our final few seconds here, who is us? America is the process and the miracle of continued inclusion, continued invention, con continued ad adaptation to over overcome the challenges of each era. What you all know from your communities and most of the rest of the country doesn't know is that this is still going on. So we wanted to encourage you in your efforts and also hope that you'll tell us what you're doing so we can share your story with readers in the rest of the country and the world. Thanks very much.